Before I begin, I want to put out there because some people are confused about these kinds of videos. This is not a sponsored video. This is a review. I've reviewed the Steam Deck, plenty of other similar devices, and I wasn't paid to make them. I'm not getting paid to make this video. I'm making this review because I want to make this review because I'm genuinely interested in the landscape of handheld gaming PCs and seeing the evolution happen and seeing all these competitors. If you're not interested in these sort of Steam Deck alternatives and competitors, that's all good. But this video is for those who are looking for other options, who do have the extra money to spend on what are more expensive devices and just uh, want to see what's out there. So I hope this video proves to be informative. And uh, yeah, here we go. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my review of the One X Player 2. That's right, One X Player has a sequel, and uh, not just in terms of sheer processing power, but also look at the size of this thing. Just to give you some comparisons here is the steam deck next to you can see it's actually a little wider than the steam deck and even it might actually be yep it's slightly taller too and it's definitely thicker it is a beast of a device comparable to steam deck size but definitely a little more in terms of dimensions and how much space it takes up but still a very wieldy device. Let me compare it to other devices like the Nintendo Switch here, which looks practically tiny compared to this beast of a device, especially the thickness. You can see just how much thicker the One X Player 2 is. And the Switch is also just significantly shorter. So just a vastly bigger device. And then you've got the One X Player Mini Pro, which is its sort of smaller cousin. You can see right here... The thickness is comparable, but in terms of the length and the height, you can see that the One X Player Mini Pro is significantly smaller. But what you do get with this added size is this huge 8.4 inch screen that goes all the way up to 2560 by 1600. A bit overkill if you ask me, but you can always adjust the resolution to whatever you want, both the desktop experience and the games that you play. This is an IPS screen. I do wish it was OLED, as I've said many times before with other similar devices, but it is clear enough and it does get bright enough that it's more than enough for gameplay. It does have a little bit of backlight bleed sort of in the corners, but just barely as far as this unit is concerned. Now, one thing to note about this device is that it is a prototype. You can see right here that uh, the folks at One X Player, when they sent me this unit, made it pretty explicit with this sticker. So there are going to be certain functionalities missing. And one thing that I noticed was missing from this device is a 1440 by 900 resolution. I found that to be a nice middle ground between the 1200 and the 1600 resolution. So you get just enough sharpness while being able to maintain a certain level of performance for some of the more demanding games. Now, I did reach out to One X Player about this, and they said that in the final version of this product, it may very well be that they'll add the resolution if it's requested enough. I hope they add that resolution because just the more options, the better the user will be off when it comes to making adjustments to run their games at the highest fidelity possible while getting the most performance out of the device. Now, in terms of the exact dimensions of this device, well, there are two ways it can be measured because this device has detachable controllers, much like the Nintendo Switch. So you've got the tablet itself on its own that measures 8.2 inches across, 5 inches in height, and then 0.9 inches in thickness and then from there when I attach the controllers like so here is one and then here is the other obviously this is going to become a longer device it's 12.2 inches across with the controllers attached and in terms of thickness at the thickest point of the controller I measured roughly one and five eighth inches which is definitely a worthy compromise given the grips here are really substantial, really allows you to hold on to this device. This is a hefty device as well. It is 1.9 pounds with the controllers attached and 1.6 pounds with the controllers detached. Though fortunately, the device doesn't feel as heavy as it could because of the fact that you got such a nice grip because of how prominent these grips are. This is a stark contrast from this device right here, the old One X player with a 5700 or 5800 U, I forget. But you can see right here, this guy barely had, I mean, you can't really call this a grip. It's more of like a little protrusion, a little bump that gave you something to grip onto, but not a whole lot. So this was just, this wore you out after a while. But this device, despite being so big, when you can hold onto it this tightly and this comfortably, 
I mean, uh, I got a pretty comfortable gaming experience and I didn't find myself feeling my hands getting worn out or anything after extended sessions. What's also cool about this device is that it does come with a kickstand back here. You can flip it up and it's pretty sturdy. You can see right here I'm flicking it pretty hard, but it hardly moves. And so you can set it down. And if you're watching a cutscene or something, you can just enjoy it like so and then pick it back up. But also the detachable controllers allow you to essentially have these wireless controllers with you, though I wasn't given the shell. You know how the Nintendo Switch's Joy-Cons can be attached to this shell, essentially, that allows you to use the Joy-Cons with just a more comfortable setting that gives you a grip and a proper controller experience? Well, the One X Player 2 has a similar shell, but uh, this is a prototype unit and that's not ready yet, so they told me that for this prototype stage of the product's development, I'm not going to be able to test out the wireless functionality of these. Uh, I don't want to call them Joy-Cons because that's a Nintendo thing. Basically, the Joy-Con equivalent for the One X Player 2. I don't know if you can use the controllers like this. I believe you do need the shell and attach it to the shell. And the shell connects these two controllers to the device. So you can't do, you know, this kind of thing that you can do with the Switch. But the shell that the device will ship with will allow you to attach them and essentially have this kind of setup but with uh, these more substantial controllers. Now let's talk about these controllers and how they feel. So these buttons, the face buttons, feel excellent. I think this is the best iteration of the One X player when it comes to the face buttons. It has just the right amount of travel and just the right amount of resistance. Not too much, not too little. It feels like the kind of buttons you'd find on an Xbox controller and they're just really responsive, really enjoy them. The analog sticks here, while it does feel a little cheaper than the One X player mini, which just feels smoother, like there's less friction between the parts. There's less of that kind of texture that you feel when you rotate the analog sticks. These still feel pretty smooth overall. The range of motion is about the same as the One X Player Mini, which means that it's definitely greater than that of the Joy-Con's range of motion, but definitely not as much as a proper Xbox or PlayStation 5 controller. But these will do just fine for your average gaming experience. The D-pad is nice and sort of in the middle of mushy and clicky. Not quite fully mushy, not quite fully clicky. A nice balance. I did occasionally find that the D-pad here just sort of double clicked when I pressed it down once. And I don't know if that's just because these are still prototypes. Every once in a while that happened. Not so frequently that it completely disrupted my gaming experience. But I just had to be a little more deliberate about my presses. But overall, the D-pads worked really well. From there, you've got the shoulder buttons here, which are nice and responsive. A very slight touch of springiness, but overall, an instant click that makes this really responsive. And then the triggers here are pretty nice with a good amount of resistance and allows you to make some fine adjustments for analog control. I do think that these also feel cheaper compared to the One X Player Mini here, which not only has a nicer sound, it sounds like the GameCube controller, but also, when I press them, it just feels smoother and more premium. The One X Player Joy-Cons, if you will. It just feels like there's either plastic to plastic friction, or like the spring inside is like slightly rusty and squealing. That kind of feeling. I'm not saying there's like rusty parts inside. But it's just got that feeling when I squeeze these compared to the One X Player Mini. And even with the sound, you can tell what I mean. Versus... So yeah, I don't know. I just think that the Joy-Cons here don't feel quite as premium as the attached controllers on the One X Player Mini, but the benefit of these being detachable and you being able to use them wirelessly is definitely worth the relatively, you know, inconsequential cost in the premium feel of some of the inputs here, particularly where the triggers are concerned. This attachability and detachability makes this essentially PC Gaming's Switch Pro, and oh, this is a Switch Pro, all right, and then some because it's quite powerful. We'll get to the performance in a bit. Other inputs worth noting, start and select, nice and clicky. You've got these three buttons here that I'll get to in a bit. These are unique to the One X player. On top, you've got volume rocker, plus and minus. You've got the power button here, and then you've got this turbo button that essentially kicks the fans into overdrive so that it can cool the device better, allowing the chips to 
essentially generate more power. So if you need extra juice for a certain game that you want to see higher frame rates for, turn turbo on. Obviously, you'll sacrifice battery life, but you'll get more power out of the device. As for ports down here, you've got one USB-C. You've got these pins here where you essentially can attach accessories like a keyboard that you can dock on the bottom here and then with a kickstand you can essentially use it as like a mini laptop and stuff like that there are a number of accessories that take advantage of those pins and then on top you've got USB-C, USB-A and a micro SD card slot thank you One X Player for including this for this device because the One X Player Mini one thing that I'm frustrated by is that there is no micro SD card slot so I'm forced to take up this USB-A slot with this dongle where I can insert the micro SD card it's just extra thing that I have to carry around that I might lose and that makes it harder to fit in a case and that just makes it less portable and just less convenient so the One X Player 2 including that micro SD card slot means that that USB-A port is freed up and so I don't have to carry an extra dongle around and it's just super convenient to have this every PC handheld gaming device should have a micro SD card slot at the very least. Now let's boot up the device here real quick. You can see right here some LED effects going on. Orange around the analog sticks and some orange over here. You can turn that off by holding down this button and you can also turn it on by holding down this button. Now these buttons here are because it's a prototype device you can tell that the buttons haven't been programmed properly because for example the volume rockers instead of turning the volume up and down what they do instead is so volume up takes you to desktop and then volume down brings up the keyboard even though there's a keyboard button here that is supposed to do that hold on let me hold it down so i can activate mouse mode instead of controller mode and then i can press this and then that brings up the keyboard but when I'm in keyboard and mouse mode these do different things I think or no never mind volume down brings up the keyboard volume up I believe still takes you to desktop and then this orange button if you're in mouse and keyboard mode it takes you to desktop as it's supposed to do but if you're outside of keyboard and mouse mode you go back to controller mode pressing this brings up the like Xbox bar I think that's what that is so clearly the shortcuts for these buttons haven't been fully fleshed out but again there's a prototype device so they're still finalizing some things is what i'm assuming now one thing that i do miss from the one x player mini is the sidebar they could bring up with this button down here on the one x player 2 this is again for the led and a shortcut button but on the one x player mini pressing this button would bring up this uh, sidebar of sorts, this overlay that would allow you to modify the TDP, the GPU's frequency, among other things. I really like that, and that implementation doesn't seem to be in place for the One X Player 2. I don't know if that's going to be the case for the final version, but for this prototype, I do miss that sidebar to modify settings. Instead, what you got here is this turbo button to essentially turn on and off the extra juice they can squeeze out of this device turbo mode essentially means you're really maximizing the power of this device i prefer making finer adjustments so i hope in the final version they have that overlay so you can turn the tp up and down set it to your exact specifications but yeah this is one way you can interact with the device you can see right here i'm moving the mouse by using the analog stick but of course you can also decide to detach the controllers here like so and you can use it as a tablet essentially and uh, you can bring up Chrome here, and you can use the touchscreen. It is a pretty thick tablet and a relatively hefty tablet, but it's fairly powerful. And if you disable rotation lock, you can essentially use it like this. You can use a vertical orientation and use it as a tablet. So that's a use case with the uh, ability to detach these uh, One X Player versions of Joy-Cons. So lots of interesting use cases, and especially if you get that keyboard accessory, you can detach the controllers and set this device down with the kickstand like so. Set these aside, and then maybe use it as a mini laptop, or you can just prop it up like this and consume some media and uh, use the touchscreen to do whatever it is you want to do on what is essentially a PC. And for artists, this device not only comes with a touchscreen, but also stylus support up to like 40, 90 something levels of pressure or something. So you can use a stylus to both navigate the operating system and to do some artwork. It's the convenience of both having a computer while also being able to essentially go into full gamer mode by attaching these controllers. And 
just having a full-fledged handheld gaming device that is extremely powerful. I do think it can take a bit of finagling to attach the controllers sometimes because you don't have that switch rail up top. You can't really like find purchase. So you have to like kind of search for a little bit and then attach the controllers. But I got used to it pretty quickly. It's not that bad. A few other fun facts about the device. It does come with rumble, but the rumble is kind of weak. It is nice and bassy, but it just doesn't really shake the device that much. So I'm just going to turn it off and I don't know. It's just something that I prefer not to have on. As for the speakers, these are bottom firing speakers. You can see the grills right here, whereas the One X Player Mini speakers are front firing these orange little tabs here. These are the grills for the speakers for this device. Now, I was told that the audio drivers for the One X Player 2 in its prototype stage are not as good as they're going to be at launch. So I did find the sound to be just really teeny and the volume to be rather low. But after downloading this software right here, which I'll bring up, called FX Sound, the volume was significantly better and the speakers, I thought, were pretty good, actually, once I got this volume boost from this software. So to show you what I mean, I'm going to bring up Cyberpunk 2077 here and let the main menu music play once we load into that menu. So this is with FX sound off. All right, so let's go back to desktop, bring up FX sound and look at the difference. And turn it back off. You can see right there that the speakers are capable of producing decent to good volume it's just the drivers currently just don't seem to allow the speakers to realize their full potential but once you turn this on the speakers actually sound pretty damn good and then one last thing i want to note about this device before we dive into the performance is the stability of the detachable controllers you can see right here that it does flex a little bit, but, you know, you really have to try to rip these off. So, you know, I think they're secure enough, but you can kind of feel that they're slightly loose. And you can see right here that the controllers do move independently of the centerpiece. But again, it, it's still fairly secure overall. Just don't like hold it just on the controller itself. You can see that it, it's starting to flex a little bit and I'm a little worried that that might do some damage. At the very least, make sure you have some fingers back here if you want to hold it single-handed like that so that you got some uh, support. But when you hold it with two hands, it does ultimately feel really secure, especially with these grips. It does feel really well-balanced. And slight looseness aside, that kind of fades into the background eventually. Uh, this is overall a pretty good solution for detachable controllers. As for what kind of performance you can expect out of this device right here, well... I will say I was thoroughly impressed. Less graphics intensive indie games like Hades or older generation games like Batman Arkham Origins run beautifully on this device at high settings and high resolution. Those run perfectly. So I'm not going to focus too much on those. Instead, I'm going to focus on more modern games and more graphics intensive games like Metal Gear Solid 5: The Phantom Pain, which at high settings and at 1900 by 1200 resolution it ran at 60 frames per second without breaking a sweat. Not 800p, we're talking about 1200p running at a smooth 60 FPS on high settings. Now, Metal Gear Solid 5 is just a really well-optimized game, but I would have been happy to scale down the resolution by a notch or two, but I didn't have to. The game still ran at a smooth 60 FPS, even at that high resolution on this, I mean, chonky but portable device. From there, I booted up Control and ran it at low settings with an internal resolution of 1440 by 900, and I was getting 50 to 60 frames per second average at that higher resolution. Again, not 800p, this is 900p. Frame rates could occasionally dip into the 40s when there were a lot of enemies and a lot of particle effects flying around, but overall a very smooth experience with a sharper image, especially for this bigger screen, a higher resolution is very welcome. Then we got Resident Evil 3 Remake at high settings with AMD FSR on. At 1680 by 1050 resolution, I was getting a smooth, unflinching 60 frames per second. This device ran the game perfectly, and at that high resolution, the game looked awesome to boot, 
even on this bigger screen. Cyberpunk 2077, I booted up with medium to high settings with AMD FSR 2.1 on. Running this game at 1280 by 800 at those settings, I was getting 40 to 50 frames per second average. It felt super smooth to play, and even at 800p, the game still looked really damn good on this device. And I could increase the resolution if I wanted to 1680 by 1050 and still get playable frame rates, but I preferred the smoother gameplay experience of the lower resolution with the higher frame rates. From there, we got Elden Ring, which also impressed. I set all settings to high, and at 1680 by 1050 resolution, I was still getting very playable frame rates between 30 to 40 frames per second average, and lowering that resolution, I could get even smoother and more consistent frame rates. So this device can really do it all. And then finally, I tested Marvel Spider-Man at medium settings with AMD FSR 2.1 on with a 45 frames per second target. At 1280 by 800 resolution, I was getting 40 to 50 frames per second average web slinging, 50 to 60 frames per second average roaming the streets, and just the smooth 60 FPS indoors. And then I can actually boost that resolution to 1680 by 1050 and still get 35 to 45 frames per second average web slinging and 40 to 50 frames per second roaming the streets. Obviously, AMD FSR is doing a lot of the work here, but still, the game looked great at high resolutions, and it still requires a relatively powerful enough device to run the game at that resolution, even with AMD FSR on. From there, let's move on to emulation performance, which this device completely tears through as well. Emulators for older generation consoles like Citra for 3DS, PPSSPP for PSP, Dolphin for GameCube and Wii, PCSX2 for PlayStation 2, etc. all run beautifully and smoothly. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. They run great on this device. For Wii U, I used Simu and Zelda Breath of the Wild. I mean, that game ran beautifully, better than it does on the Switch at between 40 to 60 frames per second outdoors. That's a 45 frames per second average outdoors and a smooth 60 frames per second indoors when tackling shrines and whatnot. And then the real test is Switch emulation. I used Ryujin's because it supports Vulkan, which is great for AMD chips. I was able to get Mario Odyssey running at a smooth 60 frames per second. Kirby Forgotten Land, I was able to get running at 40 to 60 frames per second after activating the 60 frames per second mod. Astro Chain I had running at a solid and smooth 30 frames per second, even during the more graphics intensive sequences and areas. Emulation on this device is a dream, and because you got that bigger screen with more surface area real estate, the games just look great and you can see more, and it's just really ideal for both PC gaming and emulation. I know I keep emphasizing the size of the screen, and I know 7 inches to 8.4 inches, that extra 1.4 inches doesn't sound like much, but that extra bit of diagonal length gives you a ton more real estate. So trust me when I tell you, it makes a difference, especially with PC games that have smaller text. Everything's just so much more visible. As for thermals and fan noise, I just booted up Cyberpunk 2077 so I can start getting the fans going. And you can hear it yourself. This is about what that sounds like. It's a pretty unobtrusive hum that is audible, but phase into the background pretty quickly because it's so low pitch and once you turn the speakers on and once you boost the volume of the speakers with FX sound or once you use headphones the fan noise just kind of completely fades into the background and becomes something you kind of forget about as for how hot this device gets well one of the advantages of having these detachable controllers is that you will never feel heat seeping through these controllers because they're a separate component from the tablet itself so my hands were always cool when I was playing with this device let's attach these controllers again the only part of the device that does get noticeably warm is sort of towards the top here where I assume is where the CPU is housed and so that part will get kind of hot if you touch it but not to the point where it burns you and then the rest of the heat is just handled really well by all these vents and then you can see the air gets kind of expelled through here. And you can feel the air if you kind of put it to your face. Uh, it's doing a pretty good job of handling thermals. And again, that heat never sort of dissipates where it makes you uncomfortable holding the device because not only are your hands completely far away from that center piece and far away from where the heat is at its hottest, but also the detachable controllers means that just the heat is going to struggle to make its way to where your hands would be. As for how long you can play on this device, well, 
One test that I did is I've been playing Yakuza Kiwami recently and I set it to a higher resolution. I turned Turbo on. I got about two hours worth of gameplay from that. Now, if I turned Turbo off and decreased the resolution and made efforts to conserve the battery life, I imagine I could have squeezed even more out of that play session, possibly an extra hour or so. But also, if I run a more graphics-intensive game and just have the device screaming and running on all fumes, then I imagine that battery life could be a little less, maybe like an hour and a half. So... You know, I would expect two hours to three hours average of battery life with the 65.5 watt hour battery, but it's just going to vary a lot depending on how much you're pushing this device, how graphics intensive certain games or emulators are, and just how much the device is working to uh, bring out the most performance out of whatever application you've got open. With all said and done, if you're a fan of bigger screens and don't mind the slight heft that you'll feel, that again doesn't feel like a big deal because these grips are so good, then this might be the device for you. This is the one that you might want to get. If you prefer something that's a little more portable, something that you can carry around easier, though again, this is missing the micro SD card slot. You can always get the smaller cousin here. I think this is going to be the more mainstream device. This is like the equivalent of the 15-inch laptops, whereas this is, you know, like the 17-inch laptop equivalent of these handheld gaming devices. As for whether I'd recommend the One X Player 2 or the Steam Steam Deck, well, depends on what you're looking for. Price and value are a major factor here. The One X Player 2, right now it's on Indiegogo, and there are a variety of prices. The early bird price, the cheapest you can get this for if you get this early, is $899 for the 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigabytes of SSD memory version. At retail, that'll be $1250. And then at the top end of the spectrum, you've got the 32 gigabytes of RAM and 2 terabytes of NVMe SSD version of the device. That starts at $1299 for the early bird price or $1300. And then the retail price will end up being $1600. The Indiegogo price is sort of somewhere in between. Generally, though, the price is clearly higher than the Steam Dex, which caps out at $650. And it gives you a pretty good gaming experience with a device that has a lot of great features. So if you have the money to spend, then this is also a great alternative if you want a bigger screen and even a bit more performance at high resolution. This device does feel like it's more powerful than the Steam Deck and can actually take advantage of its high resolutions. The Steam Deck was created for strictly 800p gaming, and for that purpose, this device has more than enough power to handle plenty of modern AAA games. And this device is going to be pretty good for the masses. The value is just, as usual, what the Steam Deck has going for it, alongside all of its great features and the great support that it gets from Valve and the Steam team. Value is where the Steam Deck will continue to remain uncontested, but... For those who do have that extra money to spend, for those who do want that extra power from this device and the impressive performance it can achieve even at high resolutions, if you want that bigger screen, if you want the detachable controller's experience with the shell that will come with the final retail device that will allow you to essentially set this down and use it like this and play with these portable wireless controllers that can easily be reattached to the device and have multiple functionalities for what is both a handheld gaming PC and also a tablet. And if you buy the keyboard attachment, also a mini laptop, then, you know, this is not a device that you'll be disappointed with as long as you can afford it. Obviously, the choice is up to you, but I hope that I was able to give you a good summary of what this device can do, what it's capable of, some of the unique features that do separate it from the pack. Having used this device this last week or so, honestly, I've been really happy with it. I've been having just a really good time gaming on this thing. So I foresee myself using this for a while longer, and hopefully the retail version of this device will make the refinements and add the missing features and ensure that it gets a refined and polished launch 
that will make this device feel as premium as its price point. So there you have it, folks. That's my review of the One X Player 2. I hope you found this video useful and look forward to more reviews like this where I might check out a PC gaming handheld device that catches my interest that might be worth uh, reviewing for you guys. Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts and opinions are on the One X Player 2 based on the information in this video, what you think about the detachable controllers and this bigger size, and uh, whether this is a device that you'd be interested in. And to be further updated, on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, stay tuned right here on Young Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Young out.